thank you for that. I don't know that I need to say any more. Diane said it all. <laughs> I thought I knew about me, but she knows more about me than I do. Um, yeah, things I've forgotten. Quite a few people here tonight have reminded me of things I'd rather forget, but never mind. I'll go on with that. Um, as you can see from my equipment, I'm still a dinosaur. Um, I don't use electronics, I don't use uh, uh, things, but just while I'm saying that, for those who are paleontologists, remember that the dinosaurs ruled the world for 250 million years, and us humans have been around for 2 million, so you've got a lot of catching up to catch up with us dinosaurs. This thing, for those who don't know it, is called a slide projector. <laughs> And because it is called a slide projector, it has slides in it which are going to be projected up front. Um, if I can get them to work, there we are, we'll try here. Put that on. And um, we'll dim those lights a little bit and we're in business. What I'm talking about is biodiversity. Biodiversity is the web of life more than a chain, it's a web of life. It surrounds us in 360 degrees in any direction uh, at any time. So wherever everything that surrounds us is part of the biodiversity. It consists primarily of species, and most of the speakers who will be talking in this series will be talking about their work on species of um, wildlife. And uh, that's what scientists do, primarily. Some of them, however, will be talking about the ecosystems which support the species. And without the ecosystems, the species can't live. Um, if you have um, uh, an animal like a rock wallaby, you can have it in the zoo or you can have it in rocks, but you can't have it anywhere else because it will not live on plains, it won't live in the sea. So it has to have an ecosystem that suits it. And you can't have ecosystems unless you have the processes that uh, support the ecosystems, the processes that I'll talk about in some detail tonight. All of us in this room have come from an ancestry of hunters and gatherers. No matter what part of the world, no matter what race or religion we belong to, we come from a background of hunters and gatherers. I've chosen here to use some of my Aboriginal friends. These are Wongai people and... Um, these are people I spent my youth with uh, working in the Western Desert. They were uh, the, uh, like all hunter and gatherer people, they were original biodiversity protectionists. You'll notice that they are relying exclusively on the product of the country. The spears and spear throwers are made from the mulga tree, the uh, points are made of fire hardened wood. The belt is made from human hair and animal fur. The knives are made from stone. There is nothing in there uh, which is not a direct result with no secondary processing except handiwork on it. Hunters and gatherers were very much aware of their biodiversity. And so much so, it wasn't just by accident. Their awareness was embodied in law spelled two ways, L-O-R-E, and L-A-W, and that in turn turns into religion from time to time. Here is a, a painting from the Western Desert, uh, one that's been approved to be shown to um, ordinary audiences, and it shows one of the uh, ancestral beings uh, over on the side and some of his uh, things that he has uh, um, got to... Uh, work with. I'll get this thing working in a minute. That's not the one I want. It's firing in my hand, oh, that's not the good place to do, is it? That's right, there we are. Yeah, so there's our ancestral being, and there's one of his wives up there. Women are not very important. And uh, <laughs> then here you see the other animals in the domain of this particular culture. Now, every part of Aboriginal life was based on this very strict cultural code. You didn't go and kill everything that was there because it was there. You took the surplus population out of each generation. That's something that we fail to understand. 
fisheries is beginning to work on that. They're beginning to recognise that unless you take only the surplus population, then you're going to end up with no fish at all. And there's an article in today's paper, be no fish in another 40 years. I happen to believe that's true. Um, what these people did was moved around the country, following the law, following the routes, following their travels, following their ownership, and then when they had got to a particular area, they would harvest the surplus population and move on. And the population that was left behind built up again and allowed the same harvesting to continue. So it's a very important aspect of biodiversity is allowing the retention of species. Species and ecosystems, as I said, are pretty well known, but uh, I'm talking primarily tonight about the uh, uh, processes. And one of the processes is I don't have a lectern here, so I've got to play it with these things. One of the um, factors is water. Whether water is overabundant, in which case we have floods, or whether it's underabundant, in which case we have droughts, doesn't matter. The plants and animals will adapt to whether there's too much water or too little water. But just stop and think for a moment about this place. We've got a flood coming in. Here it is, bored in. Here's the river running down here. And all the animals that lived in there are now either on that rock or that rock or that rock or the mainland over there or on the tops of these trees along the riverbank. And that happens every year, every time it rains. Not necessarily at the same time every year, but during the year. That happens every year. So water is one of the big ones. Uh, temperature is another one, whether it's hot or cold, uh, evaporation and uh, precipitation, uh, wind and storms, cyclones, all of these things are impactive. And just think uh, about a month ago, the fact that one lousy hailstorm stopped Perth dead. Yeah, you were here, remember? <laughs> oh, what are we do, sir? One lousy little hailstorm. Didn't kill anyone, but it stopped this country. One lousy little volcano has gone up in Iceland. And what's it done? It's wiped out the whole airline traffic of the Northern Hemisphere. Wow. That's a pretty massive impact. Yeah, nature's still there. Weather plays a very important part on the environment in which we live, and that environment, of course, is the biodiversity in which we live. Some of the um, other things that concern us are the tectonic as aspects of the Earth. I just mentioned the earthquake uh, and the volcano. And we've got earthquakes and uh, we've got problems sometimes where we mine too much, we get tsunamis building up as a result. But this map of the world is perhaps the most important one. See where the black bands are? They are all the known earthquakes in the last 10 years. All the known earthquakes in the last 10 years. Now look where we are. Here's Australia. This hasn't got Kalgoorlie under my dad. Uh, but and you see where this west coast of Australia has got quite a lot of earthquakes. And Barrow Island, for example, has uh, an average of four a year. Yeah. But who ever heard of that? Who, somebody just thought someone was blasting. We don't blast on Barrow Island, so that does change it. But these, these earthquakes and these tectonic movements cause massive climate change. Now, it's not something that Penny Wong invented. It's something that has been with us for many, many years. Climate change is one of the main formative factors, the main uh, uh, processes that changes environments and changes species. So sea level change is the most obvious sign of climate change. Then we can get fire. And fire, um, here you see a fairly standard picture in this forest. You can see it's burning pretty savagely. You're going to say, what forest? That was a forest 60 years ago. And the fire regime was changed by pastoralists to get this lush green grass. And as a result, there's what's left of the forest. So the whole ecosystem that supported all the animals have gone. And what we've got replacing them 
uh, cattle and sheep and horses and things like that, which are good for us, but not much good for biodiversity per se. Fire depends on the intensity of the fire, a very hot fire like that, or a light fire like that, on the frequency of the fire, are you burning every year or every second year or every 10 years or whatever, because some plants will take up to 10 years before they'll set seed after they regrow. And if you burn more frequently than that, you wipe those plants out because you burn too frequently. And uh, the other thing, of course, is the timing of the fire. Just a few uh, weeks ago or a week ago, Perth was smogged out, remember? All the smoke in the city because Calm had its uh, autumn burning on. And because of the weather conditions, the smoke just hung out over the ocean and came back in over Perth. Now, the choice is, do we burn in autumn or do we burn in spring? If we burn in spring, we're going to kill all the young animals, all the germinant plants. At least in autumn, they have a chance of escaping. Calm has a really difficult problem there and uh, they've really got something to do with it. Another issue to do with our um, processes of uh, environmental management, our processes of biodiversity understanding, is topography, the um, shape of the landscape. And what I've tried to do here is use a school teacher's gimmick with the beach down here, the first sand hills, the river running back up, the lagoon at the back, the steep hills and the shallow hills. The steep hills have eroded very quickly. There's no topsoil left on them, so they're bare. The shallow hills have flattened out to some degree and have got loams built up on them. The silt beds built up behind the dunes are mixed with sand and become very rich and swampy. And so each one of those is a separate habitat, a separate area, a separate place where separate and different species live. And uh, that relies on aspect, whether things place north or south, or drainage, erosion, and accretion. In other words, does the soil build up or does it disappear? Another one uh, uh, that is important to us is marine access. And again, I apologise because it's very hard to show this in a picture, in a single picture. But what this tries to show is the factors that are involved when you're making a decision about the impact of your development or the impact of your operation on a piece of environment. And you need to know what's the salinity of soil water, what's the extent and nature of the plant cover, what's the genotype of the plant cover, how much insulation is giving to the soil, because that will change that, what's the rainfall which will change that. What I'm trying to show you is the implications. So anyone who thinks that environment is still an art that's true. It is an art, but it's also a science. And more and more, as we are learning more, it's becoming more of a science, thanks to people like the museum and thanks to people like the private sector in particular, that are sending more and more young, gung-ho scientists out into the wild to cut their teeth the hard way. Um, we've got to think, too, about predators and grazers. And um, when we talk about predators and grazers, we tend to think mostly wolves and lions and tigers as predators and uh, grazers as cattle and sheep. But 95% uh, of the Earth's biomass is invertebrates, animals without backbones. And their impact is far greater than the impact of um, these big animals. These big animals are the top of the chain, the top of the web, but the little things. Now, here's a classic example. Here's something we all know and love. Honey for breakfast, yes, or lunch or dinner or whatever, and bees. And uh, beekeepers, uh, you try and buy your honey, you know, Jarrah honey, $14 a kilo, great stuff. But the but wild beehives cut out a whole series of native bees, a whole series of native insects, because the bees short-circuit the pollinating mechanisms. And the uh, bees also preempt nesting hollows, like this cave, the hives moved in, and so nothing else can live in that cave. The bees protect it. They're great animals on agriculture. They're not good animals in the bush country. And again, that comes down onto uh, things like uh, uh, how do we handle them and what do we do to protect our bushland from the developed land. 
Then we've got things like planned modification. And uh, this is a, where we deliberately change country. We deliberately change an ecosystem to make it productive for a reason of our own. And it's not just humans that do that. Every living species endeavours to modify its immediate environment to suit itself. If you look in your garden, and I guess most of you have a garden at home, have a look in your garden and you'll see how where a wattle tree, for example, might be growing, there'll be a space between the wattle tree's leaves and the next tree's leaves because the wattle tree's leaves exudes a poison that um, stops the other plants growing into that space. And so uh, wattle trees, we're now using uh, wattle as a weed, weedicide rather than using uh, nasty weedicides. Wattle is turning out to be a 70% efficient weedicide. But here's a place, uh, this was another forest I used to know. The man who cleared this got a knighthood from the British government for clearing so much land. Unfortunately, I took that photograph before it went to salt. And today, all of that area is salt. It's up around Minganew, and it's all gone salt, and now we're planting the forest back again to try and recover that land. Uh, again, I'm not blaming the person who did it, because at the time he did it, he was doing it with the best of intentions. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, we are sure going down that road very quickly. Urbanisation, the building of cities. For those of you who remember the good old days when you used to go down to uh, Mandurah and it took you a day to get there and a day to get back. Uh, now you can go at an uh, ultra-fast modern train and there's houses all the way. It's a suburbia all the way. Um, drainage, roadworks, forestry, all of these things are planned modification. And then you've got unplanned modification. You've got things that sneak in under the belt, things that come in under your radar. This one is a disease called dieback and uh, it was brought in uh, on soil from early forestry experiments, bringing in plants from India and South Africa which had the disease where it was part of their environment. But it was brought in this country and it's taken off like a rocket and now we have a number of various types of those. So that unplanned modification includes feral animals, um, it includes um, weeds, it includes pathogens like dieback and of course climate change caused by human overuse of various resources. The thing about processes are they're not, di they're not fixed, they're not locked in one place, they're dynamic and they are excuse me, using jargon, they're synergistic, they work, they interact together and uh, you'll get a bigger impact from two of these or three of these processes interacting. And as Di Jones remarked, we've only got to remove one small shrimp out of a marine ecosystem and the whole system collapses. Uh, some of you, um, I know there's a couple of people here from Darwin tonight and uh, around about uh, 1970, the prawn fleets were pulling in thousands of tonnes of prawns out of the uh, Gulf of Carpentaria. And they were talking about these great prawn boils that were happening. They'd go out of the net and you could catch 10 tonne of prawns in one swoop of the net. What they didn't realise is that these were breeding boils. There are none of those prawns left in the Gulf of Carpentaria. The whole lot have gone. They live in other places, yes, but that place is gone. We didn't know... Nobody understood the science and so the science is very, very critical. But most important factor about all of those processes, both the planned ones and the unplanned ones, and because of those minor micro changes which affect big areas, we have very few pristine areas in Australia. One of the most pristine areas is Barrow Island which is why I've chosen Barrow Island as my particular topic tonight. Not because of Chevron, although Chevron has something to do with it, but I've chosen Barrow because it's one of the pristine areas where we have had massive incursions. We've taken 300 million barrels of oil out of there for a start. Uh, we've employed maybe 100,000 people over the 50 years we've been working there. But the beauty of it is we still have the same species that were there when we began 50 years ago. We have the same ecosystems. 
We have the same processes and we have no successful invaders. We have one pesky plant which keeps coming in and I'll talk more about that later on. But remember that, just remember it. Now I first went up there about 50 years ago, near enough, and uh, it was a desert island. Uh, pretty big place actually, Barrow Island. It's uh, 100 square miles. That's when the tide is in. When the tide is out, Barrow Island is 140 square miles. And no, no, there's a big difference because Barrow Island as a reserve goes to low watermark. And that 40 square mile of intertidal zone is just as important as the 100 square mile of dry land. A lot of people forget that. Here we've got a photograph of uh, Barrow taken from a space mosaic. And these red patches are showing where the tidal surge has been during a cyclone. And that means that the water has come up about, uh, in this instance, about four and a half metres. So the sea level has risen four and a half metres under the cyclone. Now the top measurement we have of cyclonic changes on Barrow is eight metres. So when, if we were to impose eight metres on that, we'd get a lot more red. That's so basically the high ground there, and this is the low fringe around the edge. Barrow Island consists of a big fault line along there, another big fault line up there, another big fault line there, and two fault lines there and there. And that's important for you to remember because when I come to the end of this discussion, I'm going to talk about why those fault lines are so critical to the new concept that's going on, the Gorgon concept. Um, how did Barrow get there and why is it... Uh, well, let's look at how it got there. Uh, again, I'm going back to my school teacher stuff. For those of you who are engineers, this graph shows the sea level changes that have occurred in the last 8,000 years. Now, I know I'm not 8,000 years old. I might, you might think I am, but I'm not. But 8,000 years is not really very long when you look at a world with an age of perhaps... Uh, 4,000 million or something of that nature. So 8,000 years is a very short time indeed. And yet, in 8,000 years, that's the sea level change that's taken place. In fact, if we go back 15,000 years, the sea level's down here somewhere. It's 40 metres below what it was 8,000 years ago. But what I'm concerned about is what happened in the last 8,000 years. As the sea level rose... That was the beach 8,000 years ago. All of this was dry land. And then the sea flooded in over the next 500 years and Barrow Island shrank to those two small green spots, the two highest bits of Barrow Island. And the beach went over here. So all of this around here was water. Now just imagine for a moment what happened to the animals that were living on that vast plain. They were pushed out year after year into the higher ground. Year after year there were more refugees working on less and less resources and only the fittest could survive. And the fittest was the ones that could do with the least under those circumstances. So the couch potatoes won. They lay down in the shade and chewed in a bit of seaweed and survived. And all the big bucks strutted around and punched their muscles and died because there wasn't enough to keep them alive. There was no water unless you could drink seawater. So if you had to drink, you were dead. So the survivors on Barrow occupied every possible place on the island. Every niche, every corner, every ecosystem was occupied by something. There was nothing that wasn't used. Then the sea level went down. There it goes. After 2,000 years, it went down and Barrow Island became that big. And the beach came out to here. And the gap between Barrow Island and the beach was only about 10 miles. Close enough for birds, insects, seeds, bats, but not close enough for reptiles and mammals to get across. So the mammals and the reptiles were still isolated on the island, but because they'd been squashed up into these two little islands, 
they had what scientists call a genetic bottleneck. In other words, it's a bit like Tasmania. They started breathing with each other. <laughs> and, uh, Tasmania, there's Tasmania down there. <laughs> you can tell them, you can tell them, you can tell them every time. <laughs> okay. So what we have on Barrow was a reinforced factor of this survival thing and then the sea level changed again went up to there and we got these two small islands again and again all the unfit that might have got over from the mainland died out again and <coughs> away we went. And then finally it tailed off to where it is today and that graph is not quite right because in fact it's, it's going up like that. The sea level at the moment is rising on Barrow Island at around about 10 uh, centimetres in 10 years, about a centimetre a year. Not much, is it? But when you've been there 40 years, you can see 40 centimetres difference in sea level. And the island's getting smaller. Yeah, how about that? Okay. So let me see what I've got here. You remember that flood photograph I showed you? That was what it was like. All the animals were there, had to go to the high ground. So these are some of the animals that survived. The um, golden bandicoot, the euro, and the rock wallaby. This map shows where they used to live and where they live today in purple. And uh, these still look not bad. These only live on Barrow Island. They were so different that they were changed into something different to anything else. And uh, these used to live right through the desert and are now only found on a few islands up in the north part of the island. And these are the other ones. The possum, he's still hanging in there quite well. The hair wallaby, when I drew these maps, yeah, the hair wallaby is good. That's with the records from the museums and the authorities. But the reality is most of those are records that are 50 years old. And many of them have disappeared completely due to a number of factors. Uh, Overhunting from Aboriginal people in particular. Uh, in their own tribal lands because now they have shotguns and Toyotas and uh, that makes a big difference when you're hunting simple animals like this. The, uh, that's the hair wallaby. And this little fellow, the burrowing betong, he only lives on two islands now, but once, you see, he lived right across Australia. So I'll come back to those three species shortly. Um, so they are some of the animals, they're the survivors. The thing about all of those animals, not only are they individually survivors of all these stresses of process and drought and flood and fire and cyclone and storm and all of those things, they are also genetic survivors. They have the genetic characteristics of survival as well, which makes them quite often different species. And as a result of that, um, Barrow Island has um, 24 endemic species, that is species of animals which aren't found anywhere else in the world, only on Barrow Island, because of that breeding factor we spoke about. Um, one of them is a very beautiful little bird, the black and white wren. And I can hear what you're going to say, where's the black and white, that's grey. That's true, that's the females. I told you the females are not that important. Uh, <laughs> that, their job is to keep the male comfortable. There's the male there, see? He's tucked up at night time in the middle of the girls. They cuddle around him and they look after him and they cherish him. But in daytime, it's a different story. That's him. He's a ripper and he stands out. And his job is to attract the attention of the predators so the girls can go away and do what they have to do without getting bumped off. So he's got a job in, in, in course. Now, when I went to Barrow, and uh, as I say, quite a while ago, it was... Um, the home of many species which had not, we didn't know about them. At the time I went there we only knew about six mammals and uh, we're now now 14 so there's quite a difference. People just hadn't done the work. No one had bothered to be there, no one bothered to go there. And uh, But what hadn't happened, it hadn't had the deliberate influence of change. Uh, we had a few fishing camps, uh, we had a few um, people visited there but uh, by and large, there wasn't much change on Barrow. Then they discovered oil. Because of that fault structure, oil was thought to possibly be trapped in that fault structure 
And they were right. Oil was trapped in a structure. And so even from the beginning, and this is one of the very early wells, we kept a very tight control on the amount of land that was used. If any of you have seen oil wells in Central Australia or in Queensland or places like that, they'll take up to five acres on a well site. We manage with an uh, area 110 by 100 and that's because the Department of Mines and Energy says we have to. We're not allowed to have less than that because of safety reasons and uh, something important there. So uh, everything is tucked in and all the wastes are controlled, all the workforce are controlled uh, in such a way that they um, uh, know that they're looking after the environment. All dust coming off the rig is controlled, all water, all fluids, vehicle speeds, and so on and so on and so on. There's a whole lot of things. I'm not going to go into detail on that because it's not what I'm talking about. My job was to ensure the preservation of the wildlife of the island, bearing in mind we're only going to be there five years. We only had five years' oil. That's what the geologists knew. I mean, geologists are engineers. Engineers? <laughs> engineers, not always, they don't always get it right. And... Uh, we're still there and we're still pulling oil out of Barrow Island. It's going to be, uh, there's still probably 500, uh, 500 million barrels of oil underneath Barrow Island. We won't get it. Not with current technology. Not with the most modern technology we've got. There's no way we're going to get it. Because it's locked in. And just in case you're going back to your school days and remembering your science teacher, draw a line on the ground and say, that's an oil well and they put a bore there and the oil squirts up there. It's not like that at all. If you can imagine uh, uh, a handful of sand and each grain of sand has around it a globule of water and each globule of water has trapped in it a globule of gas and each globule of gas has trapped in it a globule of oil, that's what we've got. And it's all squashed into layers of rock. So we've got to crack it open and release that oil from the water and from the gas and get it out. It's not an easy process. And uh, that's where the technology of oil fields come in and I'm not going to talk about that. What I am going to talk about is the fact that Wapit was the company, which Chevron was one of the partner companies and driving company in it, and they made a very proactive decision to carry out protection of Barrow Island. And um, for those of you who have long memories, there was no environmental protection in Western Australia at that time. It was the uh, Fauna Protection Act uh, which said that these animals were not protected and that was it and not much else. I set up a management plan which included quarantine, no gardens, no hunting, no jetties, no introduced species, no firearms, poisons or traps and it was primarily aimed at protecting the fauna of the island because it was the fauna that people thought was such an important thing. We plotted the island's ecosystems and the drainage systems and that allowed us to plan development in such a way that we did not negatively affect any single system. And we found that uh, uplands were the best. So for example, there was 75% of the island is Triodia uplands. So we focused our infrastructure on the uplands because there was replacement areas around. Whereas the 2% uh, of Terra Rossa sand dunes, red, red sand dunes, we allowed no development on them at all. and They were untouched completely. And so we did some pretty primitive and pretty uh, interesting stuff. But in the process we found all sorts of funny things. One of the funny things we found was uh, that people have families. Uh, you all take that for granted. But there's Dad, he comes home, he's on his week and he's working in the garden because Mum's been on his back and little Jessie's helping, she's a kid, five-year-old and Daddy says, well, I'm leaving in the morning, darling, I'm back to the island, good night and off he goes and she looks and she says, ah, he's left his slippers behind and she pops them in his bag and I pick them up. Oh, I don't. Some One of our quarantine people, our very good quarantine people pick them up and we took the sand off the soles of his slippers and got nine weed species growing in from that one pair of shoes. That is how easy it is for quarantine to be breached. It's that simple. 
and that easy. And that's why we have probably the most rigid quarantine system in the world, certainly one that the regulators uh, think is as good as we're going to get. They can't think of anything more, but we'll find more. Don't worry, we'll find more. We'll keep going on it. Because whenever, if we make a mistake, whenever we make a mistake, we have a backup plan to correct and remediate that mistake. It's not just a question of saying, this is what we're going to do, we'll leave it at that. It's an ongoing process. That's why I'm still... If I could walk away from it, I'd pass over to Roy quite happily. But, uh, he's an engineer, he'd manage it. Um, so what we've got on the island is uh, some animals that um, turned up in this um, early survey work. This is a little beastie called a Planigale, little flathead beast, lovely thing. Uh, we had no idea, we had no idea that it was on uh, Barrow Island. We found no trace of it in owl pellets, we found no trace of it in snake uh, bellies or goanna bellies or scats or anything at all and suddenly it turned up in our traps. And they're not just in one or two places. Now that's an example of what the island looks like. Um, you can see there, um, there's the, co the coastal cliffs. You can see the salt visor from the spray, all this bare ground. And then you can see the triodias growing in here. Uh, and you see the sandy beaches. And then the sandy clay pans and more beaches down here. And... Uh, this is the triodia. And you notice, despite, and this is not a, this is a place called Bigoda. Um, it's not a place that uh, is, it's in the oil field, and yet there is no hard evidence of the oil field. If you've got very good eyes, you can see one road going through there, and another seismic track going through there. But you need very good eyes because we restore the seismic tracks, we restore the roads. And we project as we go along. The uplands look like this. When you get down on the ground, these termite mounds, uh, the air-conditioned quarters for most of the island inhabitants. The internal temperature is 96.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which happens to be just the right temperature to hatch out birds' eggs or lizard eggs or snakes' eggs or moth eggs. And there's something like 38 different species of animals live inside the termite mounds. And the termites themselves go out on night, at night time and gather this spinifex, not this spinifex, this spinifex, they're two different species. They gather this spinifex and chop it up into little pieces, carry it back into the mound and then they plant fungus on it. They eat the fungus, they don't eat the spinifex, they eat the fungus. When the garden has grown and they've grown its fungus, they then put all the bodies of their dead and all the faecal material, all their waste disposal, gets packed into that orchard and it becomes part of the insulation of the nest. That particular mound uh, would be about uh, 25 years old and it's just beginning to decay. See here, it's broken away and there's some holes in here where birds are bored in. That's probably where a Pareti's gone in. This one's about the same age, that one's about the same age. What we think happens is we have a fire event about once every 100 years on Barrow Island. And we think that after the fire, the termite mounds collapse because there's no triodia for them to eat. And uh, it doesn't grow fast enough. It takes two years to recover after a fire. And in that two years, they starve to death. But a few hang on and then they repopulate. And what we, I think we are seeing is these termite mounds as a relic of the last big fire in 1962. Uh, which was the last recorded fire when 95% of the island was burned. Part of the island is uh, it's limestone, all the island limestone. Never mind the early reports, said it's basalt, it's limestone. And uh, the limestone is made, laid down under the sea uh, off a country called Gondwana. And Gondwana was a big continent uh, in, that consisted of South America, South Africa, Australia and Antarctica. And about 65 million years ago, it broke up into those four parts and moved away. It's moving. And Australia is still moving on its plate. And that's why we had the earthquake at uh, Bali a couple of years ago on Boxing Day, uh, because the Australian block is floating underneath the Indonesian block. But um, because it's limestone and because we've had different climates in the past, Rainfall is acid. Rainfall dissolves limestone and we get these fantastic cave structures 
forming on the island. Uh, we don't allow any workforce into the caves. Caves are totally closed off to anyone, except some of our scientists go in. Because inside the caves, we've got a remarkable, and I mean remarkable, set of life. These little shining things are glowworms. And everyone who's been in a cave, anywhere in the world, has seen glowworms, I guess. But not this one, because no one, we're trying to still got a name for it. We don't even know what family it belongs to, let alone what genus or what species it is. It's something completely new and it's living under barrow. But it's not surprising, because the other things that live down here, underneath this cave, under the floor of the cave, the cave is a dry cave and there's spiders and scorpions and things living in there. They don't have any eyes uh, because they've lived in darkness for the last, oh, maybe 30 million years. When we go down deeper, we're getting the fresh water and then we go down deeper, we get the salt water. And living in there are fish and shrimps and copepods that have been living there for the last 65 million years under Barrow Island. They're extinct everywhere else in the world. We find them as fossils in uh, Madagascar. We find them as fossils in Antarctica. But we find them living under Barrow Island. So it's not sufficient just to look at what's happening on the surface of the island. We have to think also about what's happening with what we put down into the ground, the function we put down into the ground. So what do we do? How do we overcome this stuff? Well, it's all good things. We um, carry out um, what we call progressive rehabilitation and that is um, we um, separate topsoil with plant material in it. Now we can do it that way or we can take the plant material off first and not have it mixed. Either way works. The trouble with the spinifex is it takes a long time to break down and we do a number of things. Sometimes we might burn it, sometimes we trash it Sometimes we break it up, mulch it. Uh, but here's our topsoil going off. That's our first stage. Then we take out what we want from dirt or a road base or whatever else we're going to use with it. And uh, then we uh, say, all right, enough of that. And um, we restore the shape of the pit and back to the shape it was before we started taking dirt out because we fill it with rock or whatever we've got to fill it with. Uh, and I want you to notice in particular this the back of the pit is up here on this limestone exposure and there's the edge of the pit there and this is all the restored area that you just saw in that picture. This means that we've now set it up and this plant is going to say, oh, that's quite different to the country out there. But that is just the colonising plants. It takes about 10 years to come back because that's what it looks like 10 years later. And uh, there's that hill in the background there's the edge of the bank, and this is the growth that we are looking for. Our restoration, our con uh, restoration is based on an 85% match in botany, in floristic structure, and in faunal structure, lizards, insects, and so on. And bear in mind, 95% of our wildlife is uh, animals, is uh, invertebrates. When you talk about oil fields, you talk about oil spills. And no matter how effective you are, no matter how effective you manage, you get oil spills. It might be as simple as a dripping um, oil line in a vehicle. Or it might be as terrible as this one, which was a cyclone hit us and unfortunately hit us when this tank had oil in it and a rock hit the tank. Uh, a rock much bigger than this table down here flew through the air, hit the tank and split the tank. And uh, this is the resultant oil spill. So, and you can see what it's like. It's in a steep slope, very hard, gone over a number of habitats. So we set to work to clean it up a little bit and uh, took the tank away, first thing, and then uh, took out what soil we could, scraped off by using machines up the top, scraping upwards and then putting soil back on it. But now I'm going to point something out to you that I wouldn't normally point out, but because you're an educated, intelligent audience, I'm going to point this out to you. Notice the vegetation growing here is the big spin effects that the termites like. Because we put soil back on there, instead of us having this rocky face, 
We've now got this scree slope of deeper soil. And so that's when the effects comes back. And some of the critics said, oh, yeah, you've changed the environment, which is true, temporarily. And uh, I was talking to my colleagues about getting a photograph of this today because what has happened, once that bonded the material, now natural rainfall has occurred, natural erosion has occurred. You can see the erosion gullies there. And we've exposed the treated underside and now this striodia is beginning to come back in. This big stuff does occur in these areas where there's little pockets of soil, so I'm not too worried about it. It's called a mosaic of landscape and we try and match the surrounding landscape in uh, total, not just directly. Um, so that's one aspect. Waste management, well, this is just a backup. This is an incinerator built to support uh, backup of uh, uh, medical wastes and um, chemical wastes, things like that, which are either bur uh, not chemical but uh, burnable wastes. But now everything goes off to the mainland to a disposable site which is registered by the state authorities. So we don't have that problem at all. Perhaps the most important aspect of all of our work is review, regular review and modification. And I spoke about if we find a problem, we react to it. Each year, people like me go to the island and do a review of the island or an audit or whatever it might call, different ones do different things. They look at different aspects. My job is looking at the whole island. I review the whole island and come back. Here's some young people getting trained. Uh, this is our senior environmental officer. Uh, obviously an old photograph because uh, these guys would be in deep strife if I found them in a field like that today. Personal safety and safety of your workplace and safety of the environment are equally important. And you can't expect people to uh, look after their personal safety if they don't look after the environment and vice versa. Here they're looking at an area which has uh, been a flood. Now, this is not. This is a natural thing. And what we're doing here is comparing the vegetation regrowth in that natural floodbed uh, with the regrowth in our rehabilitation sites to get some idea of the speed and staging of natural rehabilitation with induced rehabilitation that we do from time to time. I spoke about a certain pesky weed. It's called buffalo grass. Now, if you're a pastoralist, you will know that buffalo grass is one of the great God-given gifts or agriculture department given gifts of the Pilbara. Buffalo grass is a grass that grows under virtually any conditions, the most scalded lands, and it grows pretty near anywhere, and uh, it grows very little rainfall, and it's persistent. It stays there. So for a long time, whenever we sought a binding grass, the ag department said, buffalo grass, plant buffalo grass, plant more buffalo grass. And uh, we did. We planted buffalo grass. Not on Barrow Island. Well, we did once. We planted buffalo grass once on Barrow Island. And uh, it disappeared very quickly. We couldn't keep it there because the hoppies ate it. Uh, that was great. But uh, now the buffalo grass, because every airstrip and every pastoral property and every town in the Pilbara is loaded with buffalo grass. And every time an aircraft, a helicopter or a workman comes from anywhere in the Pilbara or a vehicle, the buffalo grass comes with them. And so we get this constant reinfestation uh, of buffalo grass coming up. We've got a management plan. This says that's the buffalo grass. We have located buffalo grass in this road area in front of you. Slow down. If you're using earth moving equipment, stop and wash your vehicle down now. It's not a question of going on and saying, oh, yeah, yeah. There's a process to ensure that we don't move the seed from known sites to unknown sites. So we've got monitoring taking place all the time. Perhaps I neglected to mention the most important single aspect is the, uh, in the training program is the induction that we have for all our workforce. And we've developed a culture of caring on the island. People on the island regard this as their home and they look after it like it was their home. They care for it very much. And so 
uh, they, they do it very well indeed. Um, we managed very well over the years. So all in all, Barrow is a pretty exciting place. And today we've got, uh, I mentioned the uh, offshore stuff, the stuff in the, uh, that's uh, at the lowest ebb of the tide. That's the old beach line from about 4,000 years ago. And uh, you can see the wealth of fish there. There's uh, surgeon fish, there's wine netting cod, there's uh, uh, coral trout, there's Norwest snapper, uh, and there's a moray eel in there. And that's just under one single bommy. So for skin divers, you can do skin dive, yeah, fine, as long as you don't kill the animals. It's okay. So have a bath before you go and skin diving. Um, there's lots of other things to see on the island. Turtles, for example. Yeah, somebody said, don't you have turtles on Barrow Island? Karen, I think it was. Yeah. Well, we do have turtles on Barrow Island. Turtles on Barrow Island are the reason Barrow Island is a reserve today. Barrow Island was first set aside as a native hospital in, two th in uh, 1908, like Rottnest was going to be, or not less was. But there was no water on Barrow. But one of the people who went to build the hospital said, there's lots of turtles there, let's make it a reserve for turtles. And God bless them, the government of the day made it a nature reserve for protection of fauna and flora in 1910. And we're celebrating that 100 years of being a nature reserve this year. It's a pretty good thing to do. Some of the things that are there are those turtles. And what you've got here, these are all females. They're coming up to lay their eggs. And these are all the males waiting for them to come back in the water again. Because this is the only time they get to breed, at the time they lay their eggs. Now we have 120,000 of them a year coming on that beach. Yeah, yeah there's a turtle or two up there. <laughs> we even have a frog. Can you imagine a frog living on a desert island? This is not an ordinary frog. This is an extraordinary frog. This is a foot here. And you can see this sort of white uh, stuff because I've dug it up out of the swamp it was living in, just so I can get this photograph. What happens when the water goes down, the clay pan it lives in, it burrows into the bottom of the clay pan and the water from the bottom of the clay pan runs into the hole it's dug and then it sucks up as much water as it can, blows itself up with water, then seals its eyelids, its vent, its mouth, its nostrils and goes into a state of torpor, almost like hibernation. Okay, lots of animals do that. But this frog has a special secret. The very last time it lays eggs, a couple of hundred eggs at a time, and strings, it retains four to six eggs inside its body, in the water in its body. And while it's down there in this state, comatose state, those eggs hatch out into tadpoles and those tadpoles turn into frogs. But bear in mind, the only food they're getting is the lining of their mother's stomach. So instead of growing into normal-sized tadpoles, they're going to tiny little tadpoles about less than a quarter of an inch long. And when the drought breaks, the water comes back again, the water dissolves the membrane the frog comes to the surface, spews out these four or six tiny, fully grown frogs at this stage that immediately go into a frenzy of lovemaking and each one of those, the females at least, uh, lay 20 or 30 eggs which turn into normal tadpoles and become back to the size again. So it's one of the most remarkable stories and we've just found a very similar frog in the sand hills of Kalbarri, when I say we, uh, DEC and scientists working with DEC have found a very similar frog in that area. We've got a few other, be other secrets there too. This is our big, 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 tough, I'm tough, I'm tough, I'm pretty, I'm big. And he's the king of the island. He doesn't take no, nothing from no one. This particular one has just finished digging up young turtles and there's the shells and he's eaten them. There they are there, there's a couple wriggling in his throat. And uh, I grabbed him and uh, sprayed his back with a number. And uh, you can't see it very well, but you can see a bit of a saddle there. And I've got a transmitter on there um, so I can find out what he's going to do. So tomorrow I go down the beach again. 
And there's a similar size Parenti digging up and eating turtle eggs. But his paintwork's gone. It's not the same one. So whack him, spray him. Next day, here's another Parenti, the same size, doing the same thing, no paintwork. 28 days in a row, a new Parenti every day. What we thought was one Parenti hitting the beach every day turned out to be 28 Parenti's all the same size. So we have a completely different idea about how many animals there are. And the trackers, aha, this, not this one, but one of them, moved something like 14 kilometres in three days. Obviously he had an argument with his missus or something, but uh, whatever it was, he didn't stay. He went on down the island. Now we do have other spiders on the island. Uh, we have not on the underground, the big trinity undergongs. As I said, uh, we tend to focus on animals with backbones. We tend to be uh, friendly with feathery things and furry, cuddly things. But in fact, the biggest bulk of our biota is animals without backbones. And they're just as important, if not more so. But let's go back to the feathery, cuddly ones, the nice ones. That's an osprey. And they're very useful. They're very useful to me to explain to the people on the island just how this business of harvesting surplus population works. Because it just happens that there are 50 nest sites for ospreys on the island which means there's 100 ospreys at the beginning of the breeding season. They lay four eggs, but only one normally makes it to adulthood. This is a teenager uh, getting ready, looking to uh, fly. Uh, this is going to be a hoon, and uh, he's going to find his own territory. But the point is, at the end of the breeding season, there's now 150 ospreys on the island. And we've only got accommodation for 100. So in a given season, 50 of them are going to go. Now, whether they go somewhere else, whether they get run over, whether they get electrocuted, whether they get eaten by a parenti or a shark or a crocodile, oh, no crocodiles. No. But whatever the reason, they're going to be gone because by, as the breeding season comes, they're going to be battles for space and they're going to be driven out. And one of the questions I had to uh, one of the contractors, they said, what's one of the problems we're going to have when we build a jetty? I said, there's going to be big fights with the uh, ospreys. He said, why? I said, because you're building a new habitat for ospreys. And they're going to come and nest on that jetty because no one else has nested on it before. It's a new place to go. Yes, here we go. Our animals love the oil field. That, I know, I'm not making a pl plug. They do. Because it's a desert island, there's not much solid shade about. And all the the stronger ones kick the young ones out. So the young ones go down the shade of the oil wells and things like that. They think it's great. And you can walk past an oil well and the kangaroo will put his head out, have a look around the corner and go back in again. So every time you see a film on Barrow Island made by the PR people, you'll see that it is completely filled with ospreys and euros. Not much else in the way of wildlife. There's a lot more wildlife than, than they have shown you. That's what Barrow would look like if we could get far enough out in space and slice it down. It's made with layers of rock. And you see they're not even. Some of them are uh, open. This white ones are porous layers and these dark ones are non-porous layers. And you see there's a band of non-porous material. There's another band of non-porous material. And there's another band of non-porous material. If this were Barrow, uh, that would be the surface area. This would be the oil bearing deposits. This would be a salt water deposit. And this is a deposit that we will be putting the uh, CO2 gas into, right down underneath the field in a secure place. Just to make that as clear as I can, um, it's not as somebody said, first time it's ever been done. There's a number of places in the world are using this geo sequestration, but this is the biggest one that we have done. And here you see a shot of Barrow showing you roughly the shape of the uh, formation of the sea. That's the west coast. That's the formation. And you see the shape of it, which means that it will stay down there 
for a long, long time to come. So, none of this works. I could make all the plans in the world with the best engineers, the best scientists, the best uh, environmentalists, the best government department people, the best advisory councils, and still not get it right. We can still make mistakes because we're human. But we are constantly monitoring. Nothing is taken for granted. Nothing is said, well, that's okay. We have people monitoring everything. In this case, they monitor, they're monitoring dust, they're monitoring um, sound, noise, light, uh, heat, all of those things. They monitor spills, um, waste. All, everything is monitored and um, reported to the regulators. The regulators argue with us if they think we've got something wrong. But before the regulators ever get to see it, we've taken action. Uh, it's very rare that uh, something comes up that we haven't already taken action on. You may have read a report in the paper a little while back about uh, Gorgon has made 60 breaches of its quarantine program. Gorgon has made no breaches of its quarantine program. Gorgon has had 60 discoveries of what would be breaches if we hadn't found them. And we've reported them back to the regulator not the regulator saying you've made 60 breaches. It's not a breach if we have contained it. It's not a breach if we've found it before it becomes a problem. It's only a breach when it becomes a problem and is not contained by our processes. So here we are. We've got a situation where for the last 47 years, Barrow Island has been occupied by a workforce, occupied by an oil field that's produced Oh, 320 million barrels of oil. It's a pretty big lump even for a small country like this. Um, particularly for those of you old as I am would remember you were taught in school there was no oil in Australia. Um, not quite true. Um, now we've got this new project going on. So what's the prognosis? Is it going to stay like it or is it going to change? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's going to stay like it because the new project occupies... 300 hectares of the island. 300 hectares is less than 1% of the island. That 300 hectares is being very carefully uh, policed and very carefully uh, guarded. People who work there on this project are restricted to that 300 hectares. They don't get to wander around the island. They don't get to go swimming. They don't get to go fishing. They don't get to go sightseeing. It's just not on. And a lot of a lot of my colleagues say, but you can't do that to people. And I have to say to them, look, in the oil fields, people go out and work on a platform and they run hot beds. They're restricted to an area as big as this theatre and they live and work there for a month at a time and they don't bitch about it. Here they've got 300 hectares to live in and work on and they've got bowling greens and they've got swimming pools and they've got theatres and they've got anything we can think of. But more than that, we've also got DEC on the island for the first time, as well as our own regulators. We've got police, or we will have. We've got hospitals. All that sort of thing is there now. So I think what we've got is a situation where both Chevron and the relevant government authorities have established relocation of vulnerable species. And there are three specimens here... <coughs> Of those, that's the hare wallaby, the uh, possum, and uh, the burrowing baton. Now, because we're changing 300 hectares of the island, that means that less than one percent of the animal population that lived in that 300 hectares is going to be displaced. Now, they can go out there and fight, but remember what I told you? There's no space, so they would die. So instead of letting them die, we're taking them off the island and putting them in secure places where they used to live in the past. And uh, now we'll um, hopefully have future generations who will be able to enjoy the full biodiversity of Barrow and uh, more importantly, the science and the application of the science can be applied to many other projects and already Canberra has indicated to me 
that they are looking very closely at using similar techniques for other projects that they have control over um, and seeking the knowledge that we have done it. So I think I might stop there. I've gone over my time, yes, but I had so much introduction that I lost a bit of time to begin with. Um, 